Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Scott Fowler. I'm the president and CEO of Holston Medical Group. I want to thank the FTC and the uh, Office of Policy and Planning for having me here to speak today. I'm delighted to get an opportunity really to speak out about the COPA and, um, and sort of give our perspective on, on uh, what's happening boots on the ground. Before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the perspective of Holston Medical Group. So Holston Medical Group is an independent medical group. It's owned by physicians, it's led by physicians. It's dedicated to a patient-first or patient-centric model of care and has been for quite a while. It's been in this Northeast Tennessee, Southwest Virginia region for 42 years. It was started with a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant to serve the underserved areas of Appalachia. And I think over the, the last 42 years, it's really focused on doing that. Um, today, we manage over a third of the patients in the entire service area. We see about 60,000 patients a month. Um, we're multi-specialty. We're about 70% primary care, but we have 18 different specialties. Um, I am a physician. I'm a partner in HMG, an equal partner with my, with my other partners. I've been the president and CEO for the past 10 years. 10 years ago, as a new CEO and with the leadership of the board, we had a new opportunity to take stock and reevaluate the future and the plan for how to meet and exceed our mission for our patients in our region. That year, HMG signed its first contract to be paid not on services or volume, but on value and value improvement. Since then, we've succeeded every year in growing that population of patients, driving higher quality and lower cost markets into the region. Now almost 30% of our revenue that we receive every year is paid in value. H&G wouldn't even be here and couldn't survive on the fee-for-service that's paid in our region without these value-based payments, which are paid on a risk contract and are paid based on how well we perform in terms of both cost control for our patients, but mostly for outcomes. Um, we've scored in the top few percentile nationally year after year and have been part of a community of mostly independent providers in our region, both Southwest uh, Virginia and Tennessee, that have been successful in medical shared savings programs and in building infrastructure that you need for value. Our region is truly exceptional and is recognized nationally. So what did we see 10 years ago when we did our analysis and when I started this COO, which we still see today? Yeah. It's often said that every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. And what we saw was a healthcare system in the United States that was built around volume and pricing and was centralized around services in very high cost centers, hub and spoke systems that brought patients into the highest priced parts, usually a hospital system. Healthcare was, at that time, extremely costly in our region and, and across the United States. And in fact, the United States government had made a clear indication that it would bankrupt uh, the pricing, the payment systems that we had. <clears throat> Much of what we saw was there was a radical difference between inpatient and outpatient pricing. And that the major, the major uh, hospital systems in a region could demand much higher pricing that it could then pass on to raise pricing in other settings. Um, we knew at the time that much of the care that used to be in the hospital, so when the hospitals first developed, it's where you went for IVs, it's where you went for antibiotics. You couldn't afford to have three MRI machines, so you had it at the hospital. It was a place you could keep open 24-7, and it wasn't that as, pricely, as pricey as it is now. Most technology and specialties have advanced now so that most things can be done outpatient. And so the ability to sort of keep those things inside a, price, a high pricing model is part of the problem that we saw had to be fixed. Per capita spending on healthcare is estimated to be 200% greater in the United States than in other economically developed countries. The number one reason people give for bankruptcy is that they can't pay their medical bills. And that's true in Appalachia, Tennessee, as it is anywhere else. Um, despite these high costs, the indicators of quality in the areas were low and traditional models of care were not really affecting that. So we saw that the system as it was, was fragmenting care, that it could be made better, and we set out on a 10-year quest to do that. 
A hub and spoke model bankrupts the rural hospitals and takes services out of the areas where they should be given locally. Uh, it overestimates the value of providers that are in high specialty centers over the need to have providers that are out in more rural areas. It sometimes underestimates the need for acute care facilities, which need to be very, very close to the people that need them and wants to centralize that into a hub out of economies and efficiency. So we, recommend, we recognize the need for change <clears throat> to empower the system to move from fee-for-service to fee-for-value. And we recognized it meant the system, the structure of the system, not the behavior of the system. The structure of the system had to change. One of the things that we did early on was we decided we needed a common medical record for all our patients. We needed to know where our patients were in the system. And we knew our patients wanted us to know that. Did you go to the urgent care? Were you in the hospital? And so the physicians, the independent physicians, invested and, um, and sponsored basically a health information exchange in our region, which had failed previously under other grant models and sponsorship. Currently in our health information exchange that we have in the region, we have 80 to 90% of all the data in the region. If you want to know what the data in the region is, you can come to us if you have permission to see this kind of data, and we can tell you what the admissions to the hospitals are because we get those in our, in our data system. If a patient's admitted to the emergency room at our hospital, one out of four of those patients have data in this system within the prior seven days. It may be data that they had a CT scan or they saw their doctor. It's very valuable data. And we use it every day in our value-based contracting, but the ER physicians at the hospital don't have it. And the hospital hasn't adopted it. Instead of using a system sponsored by the community, as, fa as a matter of fact, that since the COPA, They've now decided that they're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to build a hospital-centric health information system, which may make our system less functional and less compatible with the value things that we desire to, to accomplish. We presented a letter in November of 2016 to the Department of Health after the COPA application was filed in ten Tennessee, which basically said, what's in the application is not strong enough. Not that we're against it or that we think there aren't good things that can come out of it, but that the regulatory requirements and governance and other areas that were in here were not sufficient to make this into something that we could guarantee that the benefits would outweigh the risks. The hospital-centric governance, financial, operational system proposed in the COPA were weak. The impact of the monolithic monopoly, which in this region, it is the biggest employer, as you heard, it has tentacles in everything that happens in our community. It will impact the local economy. It will impact outpatient markets. <clears throat> it will impact the geographic distribution of services, not necessarily based on where patients need them, but based on what's economically efficient for the systems. Maybe we don't need two trauma centers, but maybe we need the trauma center in Kingsport. Maybe we don't need two children's hospitals, but maybe where the children's hospital is, it needs to be looked at more carefully and not just on financial grounds. At any rate, price transparency and parity, as you heard today, in the outpatient marketplace has to be part of the metric of success. The ability to block or to squat on value, and I get, I get the whole idea that values something that we need to coordinate, we need to be interoperative and interactive with, and I applaud all the efforts, uh, and I think they can be successful, to bring people together to, uh, to do value. But we know that historically the financial interests of a company drive its behavior. And it's in the financial interest of these hospitals to drive service lines and work into the hospital where the prices are higher, and to use the hub and spoke models that have traditionally been used. CMS in its final rule this year on medical shared savings program specifically noted that hospitals were forming ACOs that were actually blocking the access for patients to get into ACOs that were doing value. Because by building those ACOs, those patients would be not be attributed to another model. Um, we were skeptical, to say the least, and did not think the application would meet the standard. As an attorney, I went to uh, law school before I went to medical school, but as an attorney, the clear and convincing standard seemed overwhelming to me, and we just didn't think that it would happen. So what's happened since the COPA? Impacting patient care, rushing changes, having things happen too quick, 
Uh, of all the models that I saw up here today, the one at Phoebe Putney reminded me of what I'm seeing on the ground, which is a lot of confusion in an effort to coordinate between a, a, a business and the, and the government rapid changes on the ground which impact patients. So let me give you just a couple of examples. Shortly after the COPA, we had about 10 outpatient, outpatient surgical rooms that were operating in town. Those were places that you could take your patients as an alternative to surgery in the hospital. Shortly after the COPA, all of the beds were closed. The center that we were owners in was dissolved against our objections. And when we offered to buy the center so that we could continue the care, that was refused. As a result of that, Bristol went without an open surgery center for quite a few months. Now, eventually, will that get fixed? Yes. Did it need to happen? No. It didn't need to happen. Um, it created bad care and bad experiences, and, and um, it was dissolved where there was another opportunity. So we think that it was probably done in order to help them control the outpatient marketplaces. We have a lot of information that that may be part of what was done. Uh, in Kingsport, the same model will limit rooms, will allow the closure of one of the surgery centers there, and will bring other players into the marketplace, possibly with higher priced national contracts. CON law adjustments in the COPA will eventually, hopefully, fix this. We were able to go and get a CON. The hospital was not allowed to object to the CON, which was in keeping with the COPA, and I applaud the fact that we were able to get that CON. But it won't be open for a year. So between now and then, it won't be. In the meantime, the hospital uh, outpatient ambulatory surgery center that is there is being restructured to put restrictive covenants on the doctors that are owners there so that if they leave, they can't be owners in other centers. This type of behavior is perhaps predictable, but is not the kind of behavior you expect from people who are trying to do the right thing. Um, the connection to the HIE in Knoxville the plan to build a separate HIE, and the HIE in Knoxville won't connect to our HIE. The threatened and the confirmed, I guess, loss of the NICU and the trauma center in Kingsport, bad for patients, it's bad for the geographic region, it will affect the economies in Kingsport. There is a lot of discussion about whether it would have been much better to just sell to an outside system. There's widespread confusion. It could have been avoided. Uh, in summary, let me just say, um, I think our skepticism has perhaps turned to some opposition, but I want to be careful to say that it's in specific areas. I do think the COPIC has the potential benefit to the community if it can be regulated and monitored, just like we said in our original. And although what I've heard today makes me even more concerned uh, that it's a bad idea, um, I do think that there are certain areas um, I think we have to recognize that it maintains and empowers an old paradigm. That's a hospital-centric model of care. Perhaps it's the most common paradigm in America, but it's not the future paradigm, and it's probably going the wrong direction in maintaining the status quo. There's no question it will interfere or block or per perhaps subsidize and inhibit other efforts that might have been made in the region because it will become the dominant place where people look for change, and there's a lot of other players in the marketplace that can bring change besides the hospitals. Um, I believe that it will fragment between hospital-based and non-hospital-based providers. Uh, it creates an economy of scale which, uh, which can change really real estate. We, we know our leases are changing immediately after the COPA. The hospital's moving things into buildings that it owns rather than leasing from other places. So there's a lot of financial need to make this money to reinvest, I suppose, that they do the things that they plan to do, which is create economies of scale. Um, at this point, it appears that the risks outweigh the benefits of the COPA, and we'll have to see if some of these things can be addressed. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Scott.